to have our first reading, second reading, and gospel connected to each other is not rare, but it's not as frequent as you think either. In case you don't recall, here is the executive summary for all three. From Isaiah, look for the signs. From Hebrews, stay on the path. And from Luke, be prepared for the narrow gate, as not all will be able to get through it. Scripture is filled with miracles, signs, and journeys that all point to God and his saving grace. Take, for example, parting the Red Sea for Moses, or how he made the sun and the moon stand still for Joshua during his victorious battle, or how Jesus turned water into wine at Cana, or raised Lazarus from the dead. The Gospel of John is built around seven signs. Those things are real, and those kinds of miracles do happen, even today, but the reality is that miracles are rare. If they, were, if they were not rare, they wouldn't be miracles. They'd be commonplace. So what is the sign that God wants to set apart that draws people to him? Perhaps the beginnings of our answer can be found in the greatest sign of God's love for us. His gift of Jesus to us and his gift of us into this world to continue his mission as disciples. Therefore, God's signs are most likely personal, directed at us. And the person meant to be a sign of God in this world, therefore, is you, and you, and you, and you, and all of us, and me. In the sacrament of baptism, we are made persons of Christ. In the sacrament of confirmation, we are made witnesses to Christ, just like those in Jesus' time were witnesses. We are entrusted and empowered for the mission and the journey of continuing the world of Jesus and the word of Jesus. As the saying goes, you may be the only Bible some person reads. Parents are the Christ in their children's lives, reading scripture to them and praying with them. But our gospel has a cautious note. The gate is narrow. It is not that easy. We have all faced narrow doors, gates, or even streets in our lifetime. Moving is probably the most prevalent example of trying to get furniture through a narrow door. Traveling abroad, you find streets of old world Europe so narrow that only one lane of traffic can pass by. I faced narrow gates in my lifetime, literally. Ever try driving a tractor with a 24 foot wide corn planter through a gate that's only 20 feet wide? It is quite common. It takes practice and then it becomes habit. Approach the gate, but before you go through the gate, make a hard left turn up against the fence. Think parallel parking. Look back to your right. About a third of the right side of the planter is already swung through the gate into the next field. Shift into reverse, turn the steering wheel all the way to the right, slowly let off the clutch, bingo the tractor and the planter back through the gate, no problem with a couple feet to spare. In theory, it sounds easy, but it takes careful and attentive practice. It always brought happiness and fulfillment when done correctly. Like Christian virtues, practiced frequently, they become routine and they form good habits. Unfortunately, in our world, it appears some routines or habits don't bring lasting happiness or fulfillment. If we get out of practicing the good, we develop bad habits. How often do we unconsciously prevent ourselves from going through the narrow gate? Is it by continuing to carry a grudge, failure to forgive, or is it passive acceptance of our culture without values, or a life where Christ is no longer at the center of our lives, but rather we selfishly place ourselves as the centerpiece of our own lives? Christians are called to the fullness of life which the wor world cannot give. And all humanity is called by God to live in this fullness of faith. 
John tells us that we live in the world, but we must refuse to be of the world. This was the witness of the early Christians as they lived out their faith with actions. When the Romans abandoned their unwanted babies to die, it was the Christians who rescued and adopted them. When the plagues struck and the pagans fled, it was the Christians who cared for the sick, even though there was danger of getting sick themselves. I am a history buff and latched on to reading the epistle of Diognetus a couple of months ago. It was one of the earliest known Christian writings from the first or maybe early second century. Author, unknown. But just listen to some of the earliest writings from letter number five, the manners of a Christian. And I paraphrase. Christians are a group of united people around the world not associated with any nationality, skin color, or custom. Christians don't create their own cities. They don't speak a separate language or follow a unique style of worldly life. They marry and they have children. And I quote, but do not cast away fetuses. Christians have a common table, but not a common bed. They are glad to share their meals but not their wives. They live in the flesh, but they are not governed by the desires of the flesh. And honest Christians know they are only passing through and that while they dwell in the cities where they live, they are truly citizens of heaven. They are obedient to the laws of government, but they live a life that transcends man's laws. All that and more, written 2,000 years ago on what a Christian should be. Most of us have made highway travel commonplace throughout our states and our country. We know where we want to go, the path we will take, and how to recognize the signs along the way to help our journey with gas, food, lodging, and occasionally we have to squeeze through a narrow gate, a toll gate, or a narrow lane of construction along the way. May we all just make sure we know where God wants us to go look for his signs, and live by the law of God as true disciples of Jesus. Then we shall find happiness and fulfillment to help us pass through that narrow gate.